Let us pray. O our Father, we come before thee this evening and ask for thy blessing, thy drawing near. We pray the Spirit may be upon the word that will speak to our hearts and all that may be to thy glory. Amen. Let us come to our Bible reading in James, Epistle to James, chapter 1. Hear the word of God. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, I give it to all men liberally, and it braideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with a word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion, and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Amen. May the Lord bless that reading of his holy word. Just briefly the announcements. Eight o'clock in the evening, Friday, our prayer meeting on Zoom. Eleven in the morning, Saturday, our Persian meeting. And then Sunday, this coming Sunday, 9.30 in the morning, Sunday school. 10.30 in the morning, our morning service. 3.30 in the afternoon, well service with Kapila Rath. 6 o'clock in the evening, our 
evening service at Tabernacle Cardiff. All those meetings on YouTube. And in the week following, 10.15 in the morning, our Tuesday Fellowship on Zoom. If I can also mention our next Sunday morning service in our church buildings will be on Sunday the 15th of November. All God willing, and we trust with God's blessing. Well, let's sing hymn 595. 595. Pause my soul and ask the question, Art thou ready to meet God? Hymn 595. Let us pray once again before we open the word. Our Father and our God, we come before thee through Christ, his precious blood and righteousness, and ask for blessing now as we come to open the word of God and to worship thee in our hearts. We pray the Spirit may be upon the word. We pray also, O Lord, the Spirit might work in our hearts and might do a deep and a thorough work and that we may grow in the graces of Christ and know the fruit of the Spirit, the influence of God in our hearts. And it might be a thorough work and a complete work. As we think of the attributes of God, O oh Lord, uh, let these attributes be found in our souls, our hearts. As we think of the beauty of Christ, he is altogether lovely. We pray this beauty might also be in our hearts and rest upon our hearts. We pray for the presence of God as well as the influence. 
We ask, O Lord, that Thou be with us this evening uh, to instruct us, but also to bless us with that wonderful blessing of God upon our souls. O Lord, we do ask that Thou would help us. O Lord, come, we pray. Come and visit us and visit the churches. Bless us together. The churches of this land, our dear brothers and sisters, the churches throughout the, throughout the world, in all kinds of circumstances, we remember them, O Lord. O Lord, draw near thy people. As we think of the church worldwide, what bonds there are between us. And we ask for blessing on all of God's people. And for those who are going through difficult times, we pray that we draw near and enable them and help them. As we read in our reading, that we are to joy uh, in all kinds of trials. O oh Lord, we pray we might know this remarkable help of God in our trials. It might seem a strange thing to rejoice in trials, yet such is our God, such thou art, O Lord, such is the Christianity, this true religion, that indeed we might know the power of God in the midst of our trials. Pray it might be so, O Lord, and to bless us, whatever our circumstance, that we might be faithful in whatever situation we find ourselves. I know thy grace, O Lord, thy hand upon us. Hear our prayers now in our Saviour. Amen. Well, let us come now to our passage this evening and uh, found in James 1, verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. We have before us here what you might call a summary of religion, a summary of Christianity. How granted it is only half a summary, as I shall explain in a moment, but it is a complete half summary, you could say. But just think of this matter of summary and summary of Christian living. We had such a verse in Micah 6 verse 8 recently. But to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Those three things as a summary of Christian living. To do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly. Here in James 1 verse 27 we have two things. To visit the fatherless and widows to keep himself unspotted from the world. Hebrews 12 verse 14 has a similar sense of summary. Uh, follow peace with all men and holiness. But with this matter of this half summary, as we've called it in James 1 verse 27, let me just say a few things to explain. James is famous for his expression the faith uh, without works is dead. Or as we see in James 2 verse 17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. That is, he's saying faith without works is dead. And that might seem strange thing to say when we think of the heart of the gospel, because we know we are saved by faith alone, essentially faith without works, faith alone in Christ alone. Faith in Christ crucified. Uh, we dare not look to any other. Uh, we dare not look to ourselves and our works to be saved before a holy God. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. His righteousness is a glorious and perfect righteousness. We don't want to play with that. We look to Christ and Christ alone. That is our salvation. But we rightly say, and James rightly says, faith is never alone. And with faith there must be works, not, of course, in our conversion, not in our salvation sense. Uh, we rightly say there, faith must be alone and not faith and works. So what is the meaning then? Well, rather, this is the complete picture. This is the evidence of being saved. Faith is never alone because Faith is always followed 
by works. You may think of two boxes quite separate. Our salvation, our conversion box, you could say, there is faith alone, it must be. Faith alone in Christ alone. Nothing must intrude upon that, no works must be put in there, not at all. Only Christ can save us. But then another box alongside it is our Christian life. And it is separate, but it is attached. And they push together, you could say, and tie together, and they must be together. And if we say we are Christians and believed in Christ, there must be evidence. We must have Christian living. So we might speak of two halves, the half of faith alone, the half of the works that follow, making one faith and works. You could say, not just faith and works, but perhaps faith alone and works might be a helpful way to put it. Faith alone and then works must follow. Well, what about this complete half summary then? Well, let me point out, it is a summary. It's not a complete statement, like a confession of faith. It is a very, very brief summary and very helpful because it is a summary. And it captures so much because of its simplicity. It's essentially love and holiness we have here, or kindness and holiness. A wonderful summary of the Christian heart and the Christian life. But before we look at this summary, let's look on these words and pick up on these words. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. That essentially speaks about genuine religion and integrity of heart, not insincere and not hypocritical. Now we tend to think of a hypocrite as somebody who acts or who pretends. And we might think of a hypocrite as somebody who does it on purpose, uh, as being deliberate. And no doubt it can be so, but more often than not, it is something a man is not aware of. Um, it just comes down to this, essentially, as we are speaking of tonight with this phrase here in verse 27, uh, pure religion and undefiled before God the Father. Uh, the meaning of that is this, that he's a genuine Christian uh, and not ingenuine. And by somebody ingenuine, we are saying somebody who says he's a Christian does not show evidence of love and holiness. And so a person who says he's a Christian does not show evidence of love and holiness, does not have this integrity of heart. It's not genuine. I'm not suggesting that uh, in the general sense of life that He's a hypocrite and not genuine and doesn't have integrity. But spiritually, it is the case. And so uh, we find here something which might offend you, but you must understand that this does touch upon our souls and many issues in our hearts. This is a matter of fundamental integrity of the soul. And rather than be offended, better to recognize, oh yes, I'm not genuine. I don't have this Christian integrity uh, of faith in Christ and love and holiness manifesting in my life. Far better to confess you are not a Christian with honesty before God. And better still to confess your sins and trust in Christ and then come to this true conversion, a thorough conversion, which shows evidence of love and holiness. You see, you might protect your heart and say, well, I don't believe I'm not a man of integrity. I'm very honest, you might say. Well, that might be the case generally. But what is the reason for you not being a true Christian? Is it God's fault? No, surely it is your fault. And your heart hasn't come before God, repenting of your sin, honest and open before God, and coming with true repentance of heart and faith in Jesus Christ. That hasn't happened. And that's because of your heart. And so you don't have this pure religion and undefiled. Your religion is impure and defiled even. 
And the sense of that comes even stronger when we look at the next phrase. Before God and the Father. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. In other words, there's no hiding, my dear friend, from God and the Father. He knows all things. He sees all things. What is more, we live our lives and our souls are open before God, who is almighty, who is a loving and a holy God. And so we are exposed before him. And what we need to be in his presence is genuine religion. For Christ to wash away our sins, for us to repent and believe in him, and for this to be a true experience, which then evidences with love and holiness, Christian living life. See, the Christian, as I often say, is a saved man and a changed man. That's again those two boxes. He's a saved man and a changed man. But then we bring those two boxes together and tie them together. It is really one work, a complete work. And so we need, if we are to come to Christ, an awareness of God, awareness of our sins, and then a flying, a fleeing to Jesus Christ. All I would say to you, if you're not a Christian, fly to him, flee to Christ. Do so with urgency and quickness, that you realize you are a sinner before God. You have not got the blood upon your heart. You're not clothed in righteousness, and you need Christ. And then to have a true experience, which then will result in this wonderful change of heart and the evidence, this lovely, beautiful evidence that Christ has saved you. Well, let's consider this wonderful combination we have here. How beautiful the combination of love and holiness or kindness and holiness. It's very beautiful in its very concept, but especially beautiful because it reflects the character of God who is perfectly loving and perfectly holy. We often speak of his holiness, the perfect, absolute holiness, the fire, the light of God, but also his love as well. is a perfect love, a burning love. And for sure we see an emphasis on these two aspects in the attributes of God. We speak of holiness as his crown attribute. And also love is so emphasized in the scriptures. As it says in the scriptures, be holy for I am holy, 1 Peter 1 verse 16. And we, and we could all, almost say on behalf of our God uh, with those words, be holy for I am holy. And have another phrase, be loving for I am loving. Although there is no such verse. And yet there are plenty of verses which carry that meaning. 1 John 4 verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 2 And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, that is love, have not love, have not charity, I am nothing. And so we see the emphasis there on love as well as on holiness. And to lack this wonderful combination is a dreadful combination. If you don't have love and don't have holiness, that's a dreadful combination. If I can illustrate it in this way. Think of our countries, especially our Western nations. And I have no doubt the judgment of God is upon us. We are so blessed in the past. Now we're so far from God. And the very things which God hates, we are manifesting. And two things in particular in the context of love and holiness, that our nations are known for their immorality and amorality. Dreadfully immoral nations. And also we're becoming known for our unkindness to the poor and needy and the strangers. Now it was not always so. We would have been known for, for holiness and known for kindness and love, a reputation for it. 
not anymore. Uh, you'll see this cruelty to strangers and to those who are needy in our countries and also terrible immorality, amorality. And if we are such people ourselves, not only do we not know God, we will come under judgment. Uh, those very things which represent him and we do the opposite. Oh well, we come uh, as subjects to his wrath. I would just give a little warning here too. Warn you against taking your cue from the politics of our time. I don't care what political party it is. They are all wicked and evil people in our day. They are godless people. And I would not take your cue and uh, take your example or be influenced even by the politics of our time. Just watch for that and rather be taught of the scriptures, be taught of God. Uh, don't go to the scriptures with your um, spectacles uh, of politics and see uh, in the word of God your own politics, but rather the word, take your spectacles off, you could say, and look uh, with your God-given eyesight and look at the word of God. The Spirit might teach you the ways of God that we might be like him. But what about a man who is holy and not loving or who is loving and not holy? Well, I will say this, if he is holy and not loving, it brings into question his holiness. If he is loving and not holy, I think myself, it brings into question his love. No, these things go together, I suggest. Oh, it's true that one fault might manifest more than the other, but the other can't be the real thing if the other thing is missing altogether and showing marks of not knowing God. Well, let us note the wonderful combination, though. Come back to this wonderful positive and how it shows the beauty of our faith and how we should love our gospel. Oh, in this world, I'm sure you feel sometimes with the world, not just with the politics, that too, but also uh, the society, the neighborhood, the people of our cities, and you feel, oh dear, dear, oh dear. But then you turn to the gospel and your heart is lifted. How wonderful it is. Imagine a man who is holy and loving. Imagine a man who is holy and kind and abounding in kindness and love, abounding in, abounding in holiness. And that is quite divine. Well, wonderful. Let's look at those two parts, the loving part of this combination and the holy part of this combination, the loving part of this combination. And so we note, visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, that is orphans and widows, orphans and widows, who would have been without support in those days in need of help. And they represent, really, in a general sense, all who are poor and needy, who don't have the means to support themselves. Now, no doubt also in our day, we must remember the orphans and the widows in our society, for sure. But those who seem to stand out at the moment uh, would be the homeless, many, many homeless. In Cardiff, I'm told, one of the highest uh, percentages of homeless people in the country, so I'm told. Uh, but also asylum seekers, refugees. Uh, that is a feature uh, of our day, uh, how they need uh, our Christian kindness and love. The elderly also would need consideration. Now there's no doubt that these dear people are sometimes neglected in the church and it should not be so. This is no optional extra. It'd be nice to have it, kind of thing. No, this is part of the complete summary of who we should be and what we should be like. We should be known for our charity, known for our kindness, known for our love. That people may say, now, that Christian, he's a kind, loving Christian. Or that church is known for its kindness to all people. 
You know, sometimes people say we don't want a social gospel, and certainly we don't. And it's true, uh, those who have no gospel, churches which have no gospel, often show kindness to the needy because it replaces the gospel, and that's really all they have. But you see, the true church must show kindness to the needy because they have a gospel. And really, we should excel the social gospel. Who are these people of the social gospel? Well, I'm sure some Christians go this way, but very often they are unbelievers. And surely, 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 we must excel unbelievers in our charity and kindness and love because our example is God himself. Notice the word visit there, uh, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, which speaks more than just words and sentiments, speaks of practical actions to help them and also to identify with them, to get alongside them and to help them, to show that in as far as we can, we will help. And of course we can help, that's the point. Well, it's quite beautiful, of course, quite beautiful uh, to see a church with a big heart, to see a Christian with a big heart. Have you got a big heart, my friend? A big heart that goes out to men and women in all kinds of situations. All men and women, because in a sense we are all needy. And that is part of it too. But there's focus here, is there not? on the fatherless and the widows. And so indeed, we do, like our Saviour did, certainly have a place, a special place, an emphasis, a focus on those who are particularly in need. Well, what about the holy part of this combination to keep himself unspotted from the world? Well, very clearly, We've been told here to visit the fatherless and the widows, to be involved in the world. Now we are told to keep ourselves from the world, it seems. But do you remember in the epistle of John where he uh, says, and uh, we think of, uh, or rather the gospel of John, uh, where the, um, the words of Christ uh, is uh, uh, quoted uh, in his high priestly prayer, uh, to be in the world and not of the world, and also uh, that uh, is also reflected in his epistle as well. Uh, to be in the world and not of the world is the right emphasis. Yes, we must partake in the world, but we're not of the world. And so we consider the world, and what is it in the world we must withdraw from? and not be part of. We're involved, we get our hands dirty in that sense, you could say, in the sense of practical help, but we don't get our hands dirty in a sinful sense. And in that sense, we must keep ourselves from the world. The world, it would seem to be here, it suggests the immoral habits, the lust of the world, I think myself, but also included would be any worldly habits where men are worldly minded and taken up with materialism and living a life without God or a world without God. And so we are not to live lives like that. We are not to live lives without God. We are not to touch immoral things and the lusts of the world and to keep ourselves well away. That's the language we have here. Um, uh, to keep himself unspotted, to keep himself well away. The word, the phrase keep himself suggests effort and striving. Yeah, it's a battle. And uh, sometimes we might find ourselves drawn in. Then we withdraw, don't we? That's what we do. Uh, we correct that wrong step and we come back quickly. And there's a sense here of no concession, unspotted. Uh, we're not to have a little immorality. There's a tendency in some, part, some parts of the church today uh, to almost flirt with the world and, and just go on the edges to show really that we are real people to the world. And you know, 
this idea of showing to the world, well, we really like you, we're quite human, almost like in, a, in an apologetic sense, uh, almost embarrassed of, of holiness and, and godliness, it will seem. But rather we should show and humbly show we are not like you. We are like our Lord because of the grace of God. We are changed people. That should be the message and should not be ashamed of godliness and holiness because that can happen, can't it? We are ashamed of the Lord, ashamed of his holiness and try to tone it down in the company of others instead of just humbly living a godly life before them. Not in any way parading and uh, full of pride, God forbid, humbly living godly, holy lives before them. And so the Christian must give no place to sin and immorality, must keep himself unspotted. How lovely then to live a life of holiness, how clean, how divine. Oh, I think if we knew God, these things would be clearer. If we knew his holy presence, we would know ourselves, the need to be holy. If we knew his loving presence, we would know the need to be loving and kind. And I trust we are. Well, how are we doing? No doubt we will come short of love and holiness as found in our God. We will not show love to our fellow man as we should, even by our, even by our own standards, I'm sure, and not live unspotted from the world, even by our own standards. This is why we need that other half of Christianity I mentioned at the beginning, the first half, that first box I mentioned. Our salvation depends on our faith in Jesus Christ, who removes our sins, does not depend on our love and our holiness. There must be love and holiness, but of course our salvation does not depend on it. That must be understood. You think of a coin. On the one side of the coin, there we have the gospel, the blood of Christ, his righteousness, our conversion. On the other side of the coin, there is our Christian life. Ah, but then, as we look at our Christian life, we say, oh, I'm not a very good Christian. But I am a Christian. I, I, I do love these things. I love holiness. I love kindness of heart. I wish to be this man, but I'm not. And you feel a failure? Well, flip the coin over. Remind yourself of the blood. And when you see the blood and the sense of God, the mercy of God, then go back to the other side and indeed strive towards these things. If we are truly saved by the blood of Christ, these things to some degree will be in our hearts. Love and holiness. Now, my dear friend, if you are truly washed in the blood of Christ, I know these things are in your heart. They must be. This love and kindness must be there. This holiness must be there. And we pray it might truly show. Let us remove all doubt and be full of kindness, full of love and full of holiness as we see in this verse. Let us show to others pure and undefiled religion. Oh, is there not a sense of God in this? Are we not showing others God when we live like this? This can't be ourselves. You see, the degree and the nature of this love and kindness and this holiness is not a better version of the world. It is something else. It is the love and kindness which comes from God's heart, found in our heart. It is a holiness found in God, in the being of God, found in our heart. It is not of this world. And so it's startling, unremarkable. And so when we are like that, I think we ourselves have a sense of God. And we become quiet in his presence as we know what he's doing in our hearts. And we're greatly humbled by it. And others are too. A sense of God comes. It's not a matter of exalting self. No, it's the very opposite. 
the self seems to disappear. And rather, all they see is the love of God and all they see is the holiness of God. Oh, I pray so. But let us close with thoughts of God and the perfection of it. Our God is so loving. Our God is so holy. And it is a wonderful combination. And what a mercy it is when we've been in the world all day and been involved, heard things we didn't want to hear, seen things we didn't want to see, our hearts maybe been affected by it and feeling that the stain of the world upon us. And then we turn to God maybe in the evening and we think of him, we come to cleanness and we come to kindness, love, and we find it refreshing, and we find it sanctifying. Maybe so even now, with the Lord manifest to us now as we close our service. The Lord might show us love, might show us holiness, that we might be like him, and to his glory. Amen. Our Father and our God, hear our prayers. We wish, O oh Lord, to be like Thee. We wish to be like our Saviour. We wish to have this burning love and this burning holiness. We pray we might be clean. We pray, O oh Lord, we might be kind and loving in the sense we find in the Godhead. O oh Lord, as we think of the glory everlasting before us, we pray. We may know something of the glory now in our hearts. Let these qualities be glorious within us and also in our lives. And so, O oh Lord, to be humbled by such a blessing and to exalt our God as we think of what the elder in the church in Beth Gallet said in the 1800s that it's worth the angels of God to visit Beth Gallet to see what God can do in the wicked hearts of men and women. And so indeed that we might know that reviving that men might see what God can do in our hearts. We pray, O oh Lord, for such uh, complete Christianity, complete gospel. We pray, O oh Lord, may be strong in the Lord, with the joy of the Lord, and know that the gospel in its fullness, that there might not be any half measure or less, but rather, Lord, we might know these things in fullness. They might not be defiled tainted, impure gospel in our lives, but rather to have this pure and undefiled true religion. Oh Lord, we pray. Pray for these things in our Saviour. Amen. Well, let us come to our final hymn uh, this evening, 807, hymn 807. O oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Hymn 807.
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.